Welcome. Welcome to day two of uh, the Pembroke Center's events uh, around the Louise Lamphere case and our particular contribution to um, the 250th anniversary of Brown University. I am Suzanne Stuart Steinberg, the director of the center. And before I hand the mic over to Kay Warren, who will introduce um, Louise and Amy, um, I would just like to extend again thanks to the various groups that made these events possible. The first is the Brown University's 250th Anniversary Committee, the Creative Arts Council, the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage, the Pembroke Center Associates, and here I would especially like to thank uh, past President Nancy Buck and current President Jean Howard, who have worked so hard on these events. And I would also really like to thank all of those council members who have come here for these events, come through the cold and the snow and to be here. Thank you very much. Finally, I would also like to thank, of course, the staff of the Pembroke Center who have been working around the clock to uh, make these events possible and run as smoothly as they have been doing. Okay, so, Kay. Uh, Kay Warren is Charles Tillinghast, Jr., Class of 32 Professor of International Studies and Professor of Anthropology here at Brown University, and she's going to introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests, Amy Goldstein and Louise Lamphere. For more than a quarter of a century, Amy Goldstein has a uh, class of 1979, uh, has been a staff writer for the Washington Post, where she covers social policy uh, and, and uh, <clears throat> wider issues nationally. She most recently is focused on the 2010 federal law, re re doing something we care about a lot, that is reshaping the US healthcare system, but her reporting has spanned Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, welfare, housing, and much more. During the presidency of George W. Bush, she was a White House reporter with an emphasis on domestic policy issues. Over the years, she has covered many notable news events from the Monica Lewinsky scandal to the Columbine shootings to the past four Supreme Court nominations. Goldstein is is part of a team of Washington Post reporters awarded the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting for the newspaper's coverage of 9-11 and the government's responses to these attacks. She was also a 2009 Pulitzer Prize finalist for national reportings for an investigative series that she wrote on medical treatments of immigrants detained by the federal government. Goldstein is on leave from the Post to write a book exploring the effects of vanished jobs in Janesville, Wisconsin. This is an intimate story illustrating the decline of the American middle class through one proud community, devastated by the Great Recession. Amy holds an AB in American Civilization, magna, magna cum laude, from Brown. At Harvard, she was a Neiman Fellow and a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. It's a wonderful pleasure to have you here. Um, many of us uh, are fans of yours, as you must know. Louise Lamphier, Louise and I are very old comrades, um, is a distinguished professor of anthropology emerita at the University of New Mexico and past president of the American Anthropological Association. She won an assistant, I'm sorry, she won. <laughs> she was an assistant professor at Brown University and the first tenure track woman faculty member in the Joint Sociology Anthropology Department beginning in 1968. And the first woman in the newly independent anthropology department from 1971 to 75. After being denied tenure, in 1974, she brought a Title VII discrimination suit against Brown that was settled out of court on September 1977. 
Under the resulting consent decree, she was awarded tenure and remained at Brown as an associate and later as a full professor in 1986. She was an associate professor of anthropology at the University of New Mexico between 1976 and 1979 and returned there as a full professor, remaining there in, until her retirement in 2009 as a distinguished professor of anthropology. Her dissertation research on Navajo families was published in To Run After Them, The Social and Cultural Bases of Cooperation in a Navajo Community. She began her writing in feminist anthropology with the publication in 1974 of Woman, Culture, and Society, co-edited with Michelle Zimbalis Rosaldo. She's she has studied issues of women and work for 25 years. In fact, it's so interesting now in anthropology to see the whole issue of work coming full um, circle and people, the whole field focusing on something that Louise had always talked about. Let's see, here we go. Um, let's see, <clears throat> and Women, Culture, and Society, uh, by the way, was a, a major work, a major uh, work in the development of a feminist anthropology, which she co-edited with Michelle, Ms., uh, Michelle Zimbalis Rosaldo. She has studied um, women in work for 25 years, beginning with her study of women workers in Central Falls, Rhode Island, from Working Daughters to Working Mothers, which was published in 1987. She also co-authored a study of working women in Albuquerque entitled Sunbelt Working Mothers Reconciling Family and Faculty, uh, Family and Faculty, listen to me, Family and Factory, which came out in 1993 with Patricia Savela, Felipe Gonzalez, and Peter Evans. She has co-edited with Elena Ragon and Patricia Savela, a collection of articles entitled Situated Lives, Gender and Culture in Everyday Life which came out in 1997. Her most recent book is a biography of three Navajo women entitled Weaving Women's Lives, Three Generations of a Navajo Family, came out in 2007. This is a bountiful uh, list of publications and you should see, you should read them to get uh, the full dimension of this wonderful work of hers. Professor Lamphier was president of the American Ethnological Society in 18, 1987 <laughs> um, to, to 1989 and chair of the Association for Feminist Anthropology from 1995 to 97. She received the Conrad Arlsberg uh, Award for Outstanding Con Contributions to the Anthropology of Work, the Sana Prize for the Critical Study of North America, and my favorite award, the Squeaky Wheel Award from the American <laughs> Anthropological Association's <laughs> Committee on the Status of award. Women. And squeaky wheel she was in the field. She was relentless. The American Anthropological Association honored her with presidential awards in uh, 2008 and 2012 with its Franz Boas Award for Exemplary Service to Anthropology, which is the field's uh, highest honor in, in 2013. The citation recognized Professor Lamphier as a founding mother of feminist anthropology, influencing decades of research in anthropology and related disciplines on issues of gender inequality and the production of knowledge. In 2008, Professor Lamphere did the most amazing, generous act, something we will never forget here at Brown. She gave a million dollars to endow a visiting professorship in gender studies to be jointly administered by the Department of Anthropology and the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. That's how you get even. <laughs> it will always be taught in the anthropology department, and we have wonderful, fabulous searches and new scholars. We pick the very best of the best to come to Brown. Her gift was a way of ensuring that the study of women and gender, which she has helped to launch, will continue in Brown's anthropology department forevermore. That is victory. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. 
Well, thank you, Kay, for that really nice introduction. Yes. Um, and thank you all for coming on a really cold morning. <laughs> so I must say that um, working on this committee that's put together um, the exhibit that's downstairs has been a really good reminder that history is seldom one uniform agreed upon story. Each person who's worked on this project and each person we've interviewed who was relevant to uh, uh, what happened uh, that you stirred up um, <laughs> carries around his or her own um, prismatic view of what happened and why and what it's all meant. And just briefly, my own view is that the winter of 1977, I was a 19-year-old sophomore here reporting for the Brown Daily Herald when the top editor asked if I would be interested in covering the Lampier case, and I said yes. Now, this was a few years before I knew that I was going to become a journalist for a living, and it was really the first beat I had ever had following a complicated running story. And it taught me a lot about how to be a reporter. So I thank you for that. <laughs> and in particular, this was going to be the first court trial I had ever seen. So being a dutiful student, as well as a reporter for the Herald, um, that spring, before I went home for the summer, I got reading lists from professors for the courses I was going to be taking the next fall, so that I would read those books in the summer and have time to spend time down the hill in the federal courthouse. So I came back to school a few, or, a few days early that fall and immediately walked over to the Herald offices and walked into the office of the top editor to let him know I was back and reporting for duty. And he said, the case has just been settled. And I said, you are kidding. Now, you <laughs> had to know this editor because he was a very talented guy who's gone on to have a very a distinguished career in journalism himself. Um, but he really prided himself on being uncouth and obstreperous. And I said, Peter, this is a bad joke. I've just spent the summer reading. <laughs> and he said, no, the case has really been settled. So that's a bit of my own view. And um, um, it illustrates the point about how we all carry our own <laughs> sense of what this was all about. And um, I'd like to, um, in addition to this conversation we're about to have, really encourage all of you after today to go onto the Pembroke Center's website and read all the oral histories that the committee of us who worked on this project conducted. Um, because you'll see each person um, we interviewed um, has a very distinctive view. Um, and in particular, this is why I'm thrilled that you're here yes. <laughs> um, to tell your own story today. So I thought we should start with a little bit about where you come from, um, because we've gotten to know each other, um, both as grown-ups this time, um, right, right, right. Uh, while working on this project. Um, I've been struck that you come from a pretty unlikely background to have grown up to be a feminist. Let me, let me just interject something about Amy's story. Uh, yesterday, somebody said, how is it possible that she wrote so many articles on the case during the fall of 1977? I said, well, she'd read all the things for the courses already. <laughs> so she put out, you know, like, you'll see them downstairs in the articles that she wrote. Getting back to my family, uh, I come from a, a Republican family in Colorado. Uh, a long line of people who've been in Colorado on my mother's side, and my Grandfather was, pre was treasurer of the Colorado Republican Party. And one of the things they got to do was to go to the Eisenhower uh, inauguration and be part of the Colorado delegation. So I have a lovely picture of that. But so that's my family background. I consider myself a Westerner and somebody who grew up in the Colorado mountains and in Denver. And you came to Brown in 1968. It was a year before the new curriculum would be adopted. And I'm just wondering if you can recall for us just what the climate was like on camp at the time and what you started out teaching. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> of course, I heard about the new curriculum right away. And I was present to vote on it in the spring. Uh, and I also ended up on Ira Magaziner's uh, honors committee because he was working with George Morgan in human thought. And I started doing this interdisciplinary uh, work there. And, but my specialty was really kind of kinship and politics. So I, that's the kind of courses I taught at the beginning, partly because my dissertation on the Navajo had been about Navajo kinship and their sort of everyday life and, and cooperation. And I was also trained by British anthropologists, and that's the sort of thing that they did. OK, there we go. And um, if my voice goes, ask me to whisper into it louder. OK. OK, so 
you came in the middle of the Vietnam War. So you got involved in some of the anti-war activism. I wonder if you could talk about that and how it kind of seeped into some feminism activism. Yeah, I think that the key thing that happened was the, the student strike in 1970. Uh, where the whole campus was kind of involved in the strike and things were going, you know, nothing was happening but strike activities. Uh, and it was at about the same time that Pembroke was uh, sort of absorbed into Brown. And the students ran the graduation that year. Um, and uh, during this summer, we kind of kept going with the strike in the sense that we had dinners over at the Episcopalian Church over on George Street. And um, sort of out of that and out of participating in something called the New University Conference, which was a sort of anti-war organization that was, had a relatively national uh, stretch. Um, I was in a consciousness raising group, uh, and actually I met somebody yesterday who was on the same consciousness raising group as I was. And uh, uh, that was sort of the beginning of the women's movement among the faculty and a lot of the graduate students. And um, we started reading feminist work and then beginning to bring uh, feminist uh, and interest in gender into our own classes. And can you talk about some of the first uh, coursework that you did yeah. um, that was really about women? Well, I, about the same time, I was involved with Michelle Rosaldo in trying to put this collection of women, culture, and society together. It really started with a Stanford class that Shelley and Jane Collier, and they were faculty wives and a group of graduate students put together. And when I heard them give a presentation at the 1971 American Anthropological Association, I said to Shelley, who might know them in graduate school, uh, I think we have a book here. Oh. Will this work? Is this better? Yes. Yeah. No, oh, yes. Is that better? Yes. There we go. All right. Um, so anyway, uh, the first time I taught a course on women here was in the spring of 1973. And I used chapters from the book as part of the reading. Uh, at the time, there was relatively little reading on women and other cultures. Margaret Mead was the main example. But after that, there wasn't a whole lot. And so the articles in that book were part of uh, our reading. And then I participated in a group independent study that Ann Fausto and Mary Jo Puel and a number of graduate students put together. And the, the syllabus for that is downstairs on the wall. Uh, it was a very experimental uh, course. We taught it to about 70 or 80 students. Uh, and it was an extra. So after that, we were kind of all exhausted teaching our regular two courses in that one. Uh, but it was one of the first interdisciplinary gender courses on campus. Now, is that wonderful photo downstairs um, demonstrates you were the only woman in the anthropology department once it broke off from sociology. I was the only woman in the sociology department. Well, that was before too. that, right. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get along with the guys in the department? <laughs> well, we, we actually had a very collegial department. Um, the department was put together relatively quickly. Three new people came in 67, and three of us came in 68. And um, we all kind of hung out together. Uh, Carl Heider, who's the last person sitting down in the picture uh, had been at Harvard and he knew who I was and he called me up and said there was a job here and so I applied for it and I got it. Um, and uh, they had just hired uh, George Hicks the year before and his wife Lene and he became my best friends and then jo uh, Niels Brow was a close friend of his and they hired him and so he and his wife Ava became friends and Phil Lees uh, was also part of that circle. He was, became the chair of anthropology when we split off. And uh, we hung out together. We were sort of drinking buddies together. Um, it was all very collegial until I became a feminist and started. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just stop you on Go that ahead. point. So once you did this thing of sort of sliding towards feminism, how could you tell the collegiality was waning? Well, in some ways, I couldn't. I mean, I wasn't hanging out with them so much. I was, you know, people involved in the other faculty involved in the anti-war movement and the feminist movement. There were graduate students in sociology that I hung out with. Um, and, but I didn't think there was really anything different in terms of my relationship uh, to the department until like, the year I was supposed to come off for tenure. So and, let me stop you and yeah. ask you about that. So that was 1973, 74. Right, that's right. And you'd been around campus for, this was your sixth year, is that right? 
uh, if you come in 68. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, and, you know, coming up for tenure is never like a slam dunk thing that's going to happen. So what were your feelings about what your prospects were as that year was starting? I mean, what was on your mind, well, if you recall? I, I sort of thought it was going to be a slam dunk. Uh, George had just gotten tenure the year before, and he had fewer publications than I did. And there was, there was a financial crisis, and there was, at the time, a start at the beginning of a staffing plan, which Jacqueline Matfeld, who was the uh, academic vice president, had put together. But our department had two slots. And I thought, well, Niels Barrow was coming up for tenure, and I was coming up for tenure, and I thought I had a really pretty good chance. By that time, uh, Women, Culture, and Society was coming out in April. My Navajo book was being copy edited and going to come out within a year. Um, you know, I had articles in all the major journals in American anthropology, and so I thought I had a really strong record. But when Phil came in, uh, came to ask me to come into his office in like probably about November '73. I learned um, that there were serious questions about my teaching. First, I'd heard of it. Uh, I mean, this was a university that had no teaching evaluations. Uh, so whatever evaluations they were, were evaluations by rumor. You know, people heard from the graduate student, how, you know, they thought I was doing, but they didn't hear from the students uh, in the class, particularly. So anyway, I was, after that meeting, I was pretty nervous and was kind of worried about uh, you know, how I was going to do, and um, I, the other problem was is there wasn't really a schedule of events. There wasn't the idea that you got your dossier ready by November and what was supposed to be in it. Uh, there wasn't a sense that the department wouldn't be in X date. Uh, there wasn't even a night, an idea about if the graduate students were going to be asked to, to write letters when. So I started getting graduate students to write letters anyway. Some of my graduate students are in the, in the audience here wrote letters. Uh, and, um, was, you know, so I, I, I was pretty nervous, especially because I didn't know when anything was going to happen. So the whole process in those days was pretty hazy. Yes, it was informal. <laughs> <laughs> and the date that you found out that you were being denied tenure was... Um, not that I remember this from back then, but I did look it up. May 24th, right, right. <laughs> uh, 1974. Yes. And what do you remember about finding that out? Well, i have been asking Phil, Lee's the chair, you know, when am I going to know? Uh, and uh, I think he did call Niels Barrow in a couple days before me to tell him that he wasn't getting tenure. Uh, but finally, uh, he asked me to come in to, uh, to talk to him. And... Uh, May 24th is the week before graduation. So it isn't exactly early. Um, and uh, he told me that uh, the, e the department was evenly divided, was the way he put it. Um, there were some questions about my teaching. It was poor, but not so much worse than others. <laughs> and my work, particularly my work on women, was theoretically weak. And those were the main reasons. So I was, I was completely stunned, um, and I thought, you know, I've worked all this time for, on my career. I think it's a good career. I'm beginning to get a national reputation. You know, what am I going to do? And um, I was sort of pretty shaken. I mean, I think most guys would have just gotten angry and walked out and said, okay. <laughs> uh, but I also thought, um, you know, in my sort of, feelings there where there was this notion, well, maybe he's right. Maybe my, maybe my teaching is poor, but not so much worse than others. So uh, let me interrupt you for just a second. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, we did all these oral histories, and one of them was with your department chair at the time, Phil Lees. And just to play devil's advocate, I mean, he has very much his own take to this day oh, yes. <laughs> on why you were denied tenure. And his point of view matches one thing that you said, which is that the university was in a financial crisis. And he had lost a fight with the then president of the university, Donald Hornig, about the staffing that he wanted to have this young anthropology department grow, so that there were only two tenure slots, not just that year, but throughout the 1970s. And his understanding, I'm not saying he's right or wrong, but his understanding was that because of this clampdown on his ability to grow the department, Tenure was a very, it suddenly became a much more precious thing. And the bar had to be raised for who warranted tenure. They might tenure. have told me the bar was being raised. Okay. 
and uh, fair enough. And um, that it wasn't so much the field of work that you were gravitating to at the time, but that he just didn't think your teaching or your scholarship, I mean, he and some colleagues, were good enough given this new heightened standard. So you've already given one answer to that. Is there anything else you want to say about his Well, he did, he did think uh, that the article that I wrote for Women, Culture, and Society was atrocious. And in the decision-making process, you have to realize that there were six of those guys in the picture down there that were tenured. And three of them were on, were on leave. Uh, so Jim Deeds, the real tall guy, he never participated in any of it. Um, George Hicks was in the Azores and wrote a letter. Uh, and Dwight Heath was gone just from January on, and he had written a letter. So the, the people who were in the room were Bob Jay, um, Doug Anderson, who's the blonde guy with the beard over on the right side, and Phil. And apparently they had a very long meeting. Uh, and I learned later that uh, Bob was kind of on my side, and Doug was kind of in the middle. And the way Phil put it was, uh, he had Dwight be in the middle too, and George on the negative side because of George's letter, and that, that left him to kind of cast a negative vote. But they didn't actually have a vote. There's no piece of paper that say, I vote against Louise, and well, I vote for. Um, but that was the way he construed it, and that's what he more or less wrote in the letter to the provost. So you began to run around trying to find some way to yeah. complain about this. Yes. And this, as you've told me before, culminated on graduation day at the department's graduation party. So what happened that day? Well, I couldn't get a hold of anybody. Nobody would return my calls. I called Hornig. I tried Stoltz. I almost got an appointment with Stoltz, but he kept putting me off. Who was the provost at the time. Yeah, right. Yes. And Jacqueline Matfield, who was the academic vice president, I, I got a chance to walk with her to her house where she was having lunch with alumni about the day before graduation. And she basically said, my hands are tied. I don't really know anything. I can't do anything. Um, but anyway, I was pretty stumped about what to do. Um, so I saw Phil uh, after the graduation. It was a gorgeous sunny day. And we had this new department down uh, on Hope Street and had a lovely lawn. And, we had this sort of outside department graduation, and Jay Dwyer, who was the second woman who was hired in the department, had made this lovely wine punch with strawberries in it. And so we were all sort of hanging around with our robes and talking to parents and so forth. And um, I said to Phil, well, I'd like to see you in your office. And so we went into his office. He had this gorgeous office in the front of the building. Um, and uh, I said, well, Phil, I tried to get a hold of people. Um, I just I'm getting no place, so I hired a lawyer, and I intend to sue. Now, Phil's version of this was, Louise was very pleasant as she kissed me goodbye because she was going off to Brazil to see Pierre Evans. Uh, she said she'd been to her lawyer, and I wished her luck, he said. So, he wished me luck, I got the lawyer. <laughs> so there was agreement that the word lawyer came up in the conversation. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were a pretty young faculty member. Um, you know, waging a lawsuit takes a lot of resources. So how did you kind of get things together to be able to pursue this yeah. avenue of complaint? Well, first of all, uh, it turns out that if you have a Title VII discrimination suit, the lawyers will take it on what they call contingency. They will hope to win the case and then get the lawyer's fees after that, uh, which you can do in a, in a discrimination suit. My, my first stroke of luck was that I got Milton Stansler as my lawyer. Um, I sort of got bounced around the firm and finally in September uh, Milton called me up and said he'd take the case. And he had been the, the lawyer for the, um, the uh, union at the University of Rhode Island. So he knew something about tenure and he knew something about how universities work. And then Jordan Stansler, his nephew, came back from California and joined the firm. And it was really Jordan that spent most of the time working on the case. He was not, he was paid about as much as I was, and he was, you know, that was the sort of new thing he was doing. So we began to have a kind of team of uh, people. Um, Sue Benson, who was one of my housemates, uh, myself, um, working with Jordan on trying to, you know, get uh, answers to interrogatories and stuff like that. So the finances were not so bad. 
you had to pay for what they call depositions, which you get during uh, the discovery process and some other things. But basically, we were doing this on a shoestring. But you also eventually had friends helping you raise money and some national women's organizations that were uh, putting some resources into your fight. Well, I did try to <clears throat> find a national organization that would be willing to help me raise money. And I finally found the Women's Equity Action League, sent out a big letter to people. Um, and of course, the university got upset that I was going to use the university mail to send out fundraising. Uh, so that was a big call. But it turns out when you look at who donated the case, and it wasn't a lot of money, $100 here, $200 there, were my friends, people on the faculty that supported me. Uh, so one of the things you learn in this kind of thing is you need a support network, and it's really your friends that will stick up for you. Uh, so we managed on a shoestring, partly because the lawyers figured that once and when we settled, they were able to get the lawyer's fees. So before you got into federal court, you had to go through some channels first to prove that you had exhausted all the other ways of getting this solved. And can you talk about the one that happened on campus? Yes. Um, the faculty policy group, which was the governing body of the committee that was sort of the governing body for the faculty, had just put in place a grievance procedure, which nobody had used yet. Um, so I was the first person to use it. I went to um, Bruce Donovan, who was chair of the uh, faculty policy group in early September, October, so after I got uh, Stanser as my lawyer, and said to him, I wanted to pursue this grievance process. Because my advice from Stanser was, you need to exhaust everything there is before we can get a right to sue letter from the EEOC that you can sue in federal court. And he suggested we could go to that the That was state. the federal government, an agency with the federal government. Yes, yeah. right, the Equal Opportunity Commission. Equal Employment Opportunity Equal, Yeah, right, thanks. Um, so uh, I went to Donovan and the, the uh, faculty policy group decided that they would take the case. Uh, I presented some charges. As it turns out, though, <clears throat> the grievance procedure was supposed to be limited only to procedural issues. They were not supposed to look at anything in terms of the content of my case. Uh, so I had some very important procedural issues, one that they took a long time to do the, uh, the decision, another that only three people were really there for the decision, um, and that there was a whole delay in the thing. Um, and then I snuck in at the bottom. <laughs> that I felt I had been discriminated against because of my work on women. And the FPG had hearings in January of uh, 76, and they were in um, at the university, uh, up in University Hall, and you know, they had lawyers, we had lawyers, um, and we did these hearings, and then they came up with a report, and they sort of found about half and half on these procedural issues in my case, but they decided there wasn't any discrimination, partly because they couldn't look at it. Um, and they recommended that my case be reheard by the body, administrative body above the department, which was the administrative um, ACAP, the Committee on Academic something. Um, but it was made up of basically the president, vice president for academic affairs, provost, um, the financial officer, and so it's basically all administrators. And the, uh, the, corporate, the, the report went to the corporation. The corporation accepted the report, but not the findings. So they basically said, okay, you had a grievance procedure, fine, but we're not paying any attention to it. Uh, but, they, but the administration decided they would re at least listen to the case. Uh, but they didn't let me bring any new evidence in. They saw themselves as only a, a kind of review panel. Um, so I went before them. Um, I presented some new evidence anyway, but they ignored it. <laughs> and then Phil talked to them, Phil Lee's my chair. Um, and then they basically decided that the department had autonomy, they'd made a judicious decision, and that was that. So that was by about May. 1970, but after that, it was sort of by June of 75. But in the meantime, we had started the suit in federal court uh, in May, early May.
Now, you said that um, the judge in the case, um, Raymond Mateen, was really significant in how things went. Right, yeah. What difference did it make who the judge was? Well, I, I, the judge made a huge difference in my case. Um, the, Patine was a guy from uh, <clears throat> you know, Rhode Island. I think he went to Providence College. He did live on Angel Street. And it's a lovely bed and breakfast where Peter and I are staying. And uh, Annie Brownell, uh, the uh, hostess at the bed and breakfast, uh, I think is here in the audience. Um, so anyway, Patine, I think, <clears throat> had good experience with class actions, which is what we filed in, in May. Partly because he had done the, there was a big prison case here a couple years before that he had adjudicated. And I think out of that experience, he'd become very kind of sympathetic to the plaintiffs uh, and to plaintiffs' rights. And he, he stuck with the law, and, but he, in all, a lot of the things that kind of happened in the first two years, he, he decided in our favor. Uh, for example, we wanted information from the university because it's the plaintiff's right to get the evidence you need to prove discrimination. So we asked interrogatories, which are questions, like how many women are on the faculty? And at the beginning, the university wouldn't say. <laughs> They'd say, we are destroying people's privacy rights if we tell you these things. Um, so we were getting stalled on the interrogatories. Then we asked them for documents. And people were very unhappy about giving up any documents because it would infringe on the uh, faculty rights of the people who had written the documents. And finally, he came out and said, look, the plaintiffs have a right to these documents, produce them. So that's the kind of judge he was. And some of those documents proved kind of important, right? Right, yes. <laughs> because Jordan, at one point, decided to put in an interrogatory that faculty, uh, and I think this was after the consent decree was actually um, ratified, needed to come up with any notes, tapes, letters, diaries that had anything to do with my case, but also the, four, the other three women that joined the case after the class action was certified. Um, so that allowed us to get correspondence between Phil Lee's and George Hicks, because George Hicks was in Azores and Phil Lees was here. Doing so, field work as anthropologist. So there, yeah, right. He was doing field work. Um, and so there was a long series of letters back and forth that go back from the minute he, there, that he went to the Azores. But it also got you know, letters written in the year that Phil was away in England or something like that. Um, so we had, getting the correspondence was pretty much a surprise to us. Uh, because this was in like August of 76, and the class action had been certified uh, in, the, in July. And that meant that other women could join me in the case who were part of the class. And the class involved uh, all the women who were at Brown, women who had applied for jobs at Brown, uh, and women who might have applied for jobs at Brown. Uh, and um, so, Three women came forward. Pat Russian, who was in the German department, whose position had been cut. She was an instructor. Um, uh, Claude Carey, who was in the Slavic department, who had been demoted from assistant professor to lecturer. And Helen Zare, who was in the biomedical uh, program and who had been denied tenure. So there were four of us in the end that were part of uh, the case. And do you remember finding the good stuff in the letters? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, a deposition is what happens in a lawyer's office, but you're under oath. You're being deposed by the other side, usually, uh, and the lawyer asks the questions, and you have to, of course, answer them. So it's a pretty nerve-wracking experience. I went through it myself, but we had Phil on the hot seat that day. And uh, he had brought with him the letters that he had gotten <clears throat> from George Hicks. And, um, uh, my friend Sue Benson was there with me, and uh, so we got to look at these letters over lunch. So we were put in this little room, and a gal who was a secretary for the law firm was sitting in the corner watching us. So we couldn't actually have much of a conversation about what we were seeing. But she was reading, and I was reading, and I would sort of say, did you see this? I had to whisper it, <laughs> and say, hey, what about this? 
And so we were sort of going, ah, <laughs> over all these letters. And of course, couldn't say very much, but we knew that we had a kind of treasure trove of opinions from uh, um, George. And so we knew there was also another side. There were Phil's letters that George had, so we got them. But the thing is, when we got these letters, a bunch of them were whited out. There were these paragraphs that were sort of like taped over with white tape and a little check mark on them. And we asked them why they blanked out some of the letters, and they said, well, they're either irrelevant or potentially libelous. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, oh, we'd like to know about the libelous parts. <laughs> So they didn't want to give up the libelous parts, so we went to court on that one. And at, the point, at that point, they decided to, to, to cite the department for uh, contempt. Because the university was not being very forthcoming about all these documents. And so we, we really felt we needed the judge to sort of say they have to hand over stuff. Um, so we, we, we did have a hearing in court, but in the end, people started to give up the documents, and we did get the letters with the parts uh, blocked out. I mean, it is true that a lot of stuff that got blocked out was not about me, but was about somebody else, and was essentially irrelevant to the case, but <laughs> there's a lot of good kind of more gossip, I guess. Yeah, and there's a lot of urban mythology that's growing up around those letters. Oh, yes. I, I discovered this urban mythology just this last uh, summer, because I hadn't realized that there were supposed to be things in there about my body, about my it's in my ass or something like that. And I, I was completely astounded because I had never seen anything like that in the letters or nobody had ever said anything to me about my body. I mean, you know, these guys were, have been my best friends and they've been pretty nice to me and they continued to be nice uh, in the sense of, you know, treating me like a, an adult person. Um, but I don't know, when, when Nancy Buck went through these letters, she found a code downstairs. It's about the graduate student's body. So. There was something in there. But this sort of urban myth went around, because last summer I was talking to people in different parts of the country, uh, and everybody had heard this story, that there were really nasty things said about you know, my body and other women's bodies in these letters, which is not what I thought was in the letters. Um, what I saw in the letters, it's the kind of thing you'll see in the exhibit downstairs, that there was really collusion uh, and what I thought was pretty improper collusion uh, between George Hicks and Phil Lees. Um, George wrote a kind of scathing letter about my uh, presentation in his class and you know, was kind of astounded, for example, that I brought up um, at the end of the lecture for about five minutes uh, the notion that we were protesting the university club's exclusion of women, both for membership and you can't sit there at lunch either. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there was very little there about my publications. So Phil wrote back and said, listen, if you really are serious about Louise not getting tenure, you should write something about her publications. You know, I'll just clip out the last two lines and add the next page, which is what happened. Um, and then uh, George also put a, a lot of pressure on at least one of his graduate students you know, to write a negative letter for me, partly because I've been getting people to write positive letters and even they felt they needed something in there. So that was the kind of damning stuff that was in the letter. That's the kind of stuff I thought was, that was, was damning, that, that was, you could, you could certainly bring a, to, to, in a trial to the notion that um, you know, these people were not making objective, judicious, careful decisions that there was a lot of uh, bias against, certainly, uh, the, 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 <clears throat> the work I was doing uh, about women. I mean, and it, at yeah. that point, you were still thinking that there was going to be a trial. Like, I had been thinking there was going to be a trial when I was a student here. Well, so it, Howard Swearer came, and what changed? It made a huge difference that Swearer came, because... This was in January of 1977, uh, he right. became the new president. Of the uh, because... Um, Merton Stoltz had sort of been the interim president after Harnig left. And since Merton Stoltz was a defendant, Phillies was a defendant, Harnig was a defendant, you know, when you've got people that are in that position, they don't want to, like, give up. But if someone new comes on the scene, then you've got the opportunity for a new, fresh pair of eyes. And somebody who doesn't have any 
interested in the sense that it wasn't part of the, their situation. And Howard, I think, came as this guy who wanted to raise money for Brown. He wanted to do, you know, new things. And this case was just a drag, and it was also costing them a lot of money, comparatively. I mean, it was something like $400,000, but that was a lot of money in those days. And uh, especially because by that time, they also gotten a new law firm from Boston, so there were two law firms involved. And so the legal fees, I think, were, were, were running up, and it was costing them a fair amount of time to like find the documents, Xerox them, give them to us. Uh, so they were beginning to even amortize the expenses. And so I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but uh, Howard was willing to have a conversation with us without the lawyers. So it was just Howard Swear and George Bortz, who was a professor in economics, and then the four of us plaintiffs who came in and sat down with him and he explained that he was really interested in settling the case. And that was the beginning of being able to settle. Okay, so then the settlement happened, and let me do that. Let me do the first meeting. The settlement. Okay, <laughs> uh, because w when we started to have meetings about the settlement, um, the faculty wanted to be involved because they gotten their own lawyer, in fact, because they had been worried about their letters of recommendations over being seen by a whole bunch of people. Um, so the FPG appointed a committee that Arlene Gordon was head of, and she had been head of the committee that did the preliminary uh, grievance procedure I went through. And she's been a terrific, important person in this case as well. She was the athletic director in the Pembroke days and was the few women with tenure when the merger had happened. So she had a lot of standing on the Yes, side right. She was, you know. And the other, other thing, she's a really good-hearted person who wanted to be fair. And, um, you know, it's really sort of a tragedy. She never got to be athletic director of the whole university. But she, she turned out to be a tremendous important person in my, in my case. So she was uh, head of, the, or she was on this committee of faculty. Um, and so um, they met with us to begin with. To begin with, we had this kind of secret meeting down in the women's field house in the third floor. And it was a, quite a cast of characters. You know, they had six lawyers. We had our two lawyers. There was four of us. Then there was the faculty committee. So it was this whole room full of people. And of course, we started out, you know, like they were over here and we were over there. Uh, but eventually, we got something we agreed to. The, the plaintiffs, that's Jordan and Milton and us, kind of drafted the consent decree. Um, and they could took a look at it and didn't like a lot of it. So we worked on pieces of it. And Milton said at some point, well, if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and Peter Evans did the work on the goals and timetables. Um, and eventually... Which is for hiring and promoting right, and tenuring right. women. I mean, I can say what's in the consent decree if you want. Why right you just, we're, we're kind of running short on time, so why yeah. don't you just do like a teeny synopsis on the consent decree? Well, the thing about the consent decree, and you can read it downstairs, is that it did have a lot of good procedures in it. So finally we had some procedures, which actually the university had been trying to put in place before all this happened. So that's why they were really to agree with it. We started to have teaching evaluations. Departments had to come up with criteria. Um, there had to be uh, clear things in, in a person's dossier. Um, and there had to be a sort of timetable. So we, we got all of that into the consent decree. And we got these goals and timetables. And what those were was a plan for how many women uh, would we get hired and how many women would we get tenured over a 10 year period. So we came up with the, the slogan 57 women by 87, that was 10 years later, would be tenured and there would be 100 women on the faculty. Um, so the university was willing to go with the goal, goals and timetables and with all of the rest of it. Plus, we set up the Affirmative Action Monitoring Committee, which you'll hear about later. But they were basically there, two people chosen by the plaintiffs. Two cho chosen by the faculty, and the fifth person was chosen by the four other people. They reviewed every hiring, every uh, tenure decision, every uh, re renewal decision, every promotion decision uh, for the length of the time that the consent decree lasted. Now, the very beginning of the consent decree says that Brown did not discriminate against you. Right. Given what you got, did it matter that they never admitted discrimination? Well, it turns out that any consent decree does that. You always give up the discrimination issue 
or that, you know, the defendants were wrong somehow. Um, but that's what you, you give that up in order to get the stuff you need to have. And so. And that was okay with you? In the end, who cared? I mean, we've been working on this thing for two and a half years, and what we really wanted was we wanted our jobs back. And the three of us that got uh, tenure, and Pat Russian got a settlement, um, and we wanted the university changed. We wanted to have, you know, real procedures. And of course, across the country at this time, people were starting to put in procedures. Um, so I, it was partly because there were a lot of these Title VII cases, but this one was one of the ones that had a positive end. Lots of women who sued didn't get anything but a cash settlement, or they didn't get any place. But this was one of the most successful uh, Title VII suits in the country. I've got just a couple more questions, then maybe we can sneak in to yeah, we got the audience. Um, Queer. <laughs> so just a couple more things. As you just said, you got your job back. You had been at the University of New Mexico. You came back here for several years. And what was it like for you to be working with the people who had rejected you for tenure? Pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the time I came back, George Hicks, who had written the most negative letter, was the chair. And so I didn't talk to him very much. <laughs> I really wasn't on speaking terms with him. Uh, which makes it kind of hard, because if you want anything like travel money to go to the anthropology meetings or something like that, you do have to talk to the chairman. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the tenured faculty, and the, it, it, Bob Jay was perfectly friendly, but, you know, the, the other folks were a little standoffish. Um, but, you know, I came back, I started teaching courses on gender, you know, I was starting to get good graduate students, Mary Moran's here. Uh, who was one of my first graduate students in that period. Um, and, and so for the, 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 the students and the new faculty, people that had come since then were perfectly friendly. But I also began to feel that, it, you know, that because of the case and because of the way in which a number of faculty and Howard began to feel about the case, that I'd never get to have an administrative position here. I wouldn't ever end up being head of the Pembroke Institute for a prior for example, or chair of the department. And I felt kind of stuck uh, because I had this kind of legacy. You know, there were some mixed feelings, which I'm sure we can hear about in the next panel. Um, um, and uh, New Mexico had always been, you know, a welcoming place to me, and it's back near my hometown of Denver. It's, and i had done field work in New Mexico. And, it was sort of very attractive to be able to go back there, uh, which when a position came up, I applied for and you know, decided to leave Brown. So just two more things. This is not so much about you, but about that word legacy that's part of this exhibit. Yeah. So when you look at either this campus or universities in general, uh, having gone through the experiences that you did as a young yeah. faculty member, what are the remaining issues that you see that need to be solved for women? Well, I still think there need to be more women faculty. I mean, you know, somebody said to me after looking at those statistics yesterday, well, why is it that women are only 30% when the number of students that are women in most universities, including Brown, is about 55%. Um, and I think it's still hard for women to get into top administrative positions. I mean, there, you know, there have been some really good presidents that are women, uh, and, but there need to be, uh, need to be more. So finally, I've heard you talk about one of the lessons of the feminist movement back in, back yeah, in the day, right. being that the personal and the political are interwoven. And and I just wonder if you can... Yeah, let me, let me say a little bit something about that, because that is something we really learned in the early 70s in our consciousness raising groups. And I think the most important thing to do is to try to change institutions. Um, because if you can't change institutions, you really don't have much social change. And so. What's important about this case is that I helped change an institution. And so Brown is a very different place than it was 40 years ago. Um, and there are more women here. There are more courses on women. Uh, there's more atmosphere uh, about diversity. Um, and it, so changing an institution is really what it's about. And sometimes it's changing laws and, and regulations. And sometimes it's doing other things to change. Uh, institutions. So the personal and political for me is something that's incredibly important, not in just in universities, but throughout the society. If you really want to do something, you've got to work at changing 
an institution because that will have a, a legacy that will have that will continue on in the future that will make life different for the next generation and that's really what we want what we are about terrific so i suspect i'm not yeah. the only one who's got some questions um does anybody want to add something? Yeah. Probably just monitor a little sure. bit. <clears throat> um, so yes, we will open up the floor for questions. There will be microphones floating around. Okay. Yes, please. Um, Hi, Louise. Hi, Mark. Uh, um, I just like to. Um, so put the mic closer to you. I'm sorry. What do I need to do on this? I'm not Is that doing That's it? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Mark Handler. I was an undergraduate who, uh, from 1969 and then a graduate student in the anthropology department. I TA'd for Louise's first women's course and um, um, we haven't seen each other in a very long time, That's right. so it's, not, it's very nice to see you. Um, and just so that what I'm about to say won't be misunderstood, there's never been any difference between us on um, the politics of all of this. Um, there's a difference between our understanding of what happened in the anthropology department. Yeah, I but, I'm sure there must be. But I just like to, because of one thing that you cited in, uh, in, in talking about the, the, the smoking, with smoking guns in the uh, letters, it's, it's a misunderstanding and, and I'd like to just offer a personal viewpoint on it. I'm the graduate student that was the recipient of George's letter, the one that's, there's a quote about pressuring. Yeah, uh, right, well, yeah. Uh, George didn't pressure me. He did use the word, uh, I would actually prefer that the entire text of the letter appear. I don't believe it belongs on the wall with the offensive remarks quoted from Phil. Um, um, you talked about encouraging graduate students to submit letters on your behalf. What's missing there is I was carrying out field work in the Azores at the same time as George. I lived with George for a period of time and then was on a neighboring island. So you see the letter that comes at a certain point in what had been a long conversation, both of us wrestling with sorting out the demands of friendship. We were felt close to you and I felt even closer to Niels and George, of course, had been in graduate school. Right, yeah. And we had talked about the financial constraints and, and where the department should go. So I, I just, I hope we have the chance to talk. So yeah, we should talk. Out, this is a kind of urban myth too, unintentionally, a misreading of, of that document. And could I just, now in the personal parts, and could I ask a question? Because I know we wrestled with the personal, um, personal aspect and the institutional needs in, in, yeah. in, in <clears throat> trying to sort out personal loyalty and our obligations to our friends from our notions of obligations to the university and to the discipline. In your own, as I understand it, part of the whole notion behind the reform that was imposed was to try to get personalism and who knew who and the old boys network out of the process yeah, right, yeah. and putting in pretty bureaucratic procedures. But there's a sense of that I picked up from your squeaky wheel article that you thought it was um, wrong, that you felt that you thought it was wrong on the part of your friends not to stand by you for the friendship. And I just wonder. Try that again. George, yeah. George and I wrestling with this. Oh, yeah. We thought that the institutional needs um, um, had to be. Well, I think one of, one, of, one, of the, one of the problems has to do with, it seems to me, I mean, everybody knew there was this financial crisis, okay? But and then, then people knew there was a staffing plan, but there, it was not clear to anybody who was a tenured person um, that the bar had been raised, for example. Um, and the staffing plan was kind of working in the sense that there wasn't a clear presentation of it. Uh, like, for example, this business about two slots. <laughs> Uh, I didn't figure out until pretty recently that one slot was for the first five years and the second was for the second five years. And I certainly didn't know that, you know, Phil had tried to get more and didn't. Um, so it, it had a lot to do with this kind of cultural secrecy around salaries, around uh, administrative decisions at a private university. Um, 
So, you know, if the bar is being raised, you have to tell people. And one of the things that the consent decree gave, uh, I mean, the first thing there is every department has to have criteria. And if you're going to say, um, you know, people have to be the most excellent person in the, in the country, that's sort of the Harvard standard, then you really got to, like, say that. And you have to say, how do you know that? Well, you know that because five letters say this is the most excellent person in the country. Or you can see it because they've already published six books or something. But if, you're, but if you don't have that stuff written down uh, and, and forthrightly told to everybody who's an untainted person, it just isn't fair. That's kind of the way I see it. And I think I, I, I do see that there are, you know, students have different relationships Faculty, and they'd be very close to several of them. Um, and I think a lot of you guys were put under put in pressure, some from, people, from me and other people from my colleagues. But um, I think if there had been a more clear way in which the students' um, opinions were solicited, like you send out a letter to all the graduate students, not on April 15th, do May 1st, but at the very beginning, I mean, at New Mexico, um, we are, could you give me some more water? Yes, absolutely. There is some more, Louise. Oh, okay. thanks. Um, we have a student on the tenure committee uh, in each case. And what their job is is to get the uh, student uh, letters and stuff together. Um, so it's those kind of reforms. I mean, the, the, one of the other things the consent decree did was to have a kind of tenure committee in each department if the department was large enough. So that three people would kind of be there getting the information, going through it, giving a report to the faculty, um, and kind of making sure that um, everything was there, um, et cetera. And that, when you have that kind of system put in place, then you know, people's loyalties or don't get in the way so much uh, because the students you know, know they're supposed to get a letter in by November 1st, it's boot out. Um, and it, 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 you know, it, 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 it takes that kind of personal pressure out of the thing, I think. Yeah, he has the microphone, okay. Hi, I'm Peter Allen. I was a grad student <laughs> from 1966 to 72. And George Hicks was my dissertation advisor. Louise and Phil were both on my committee. Yeah, right. Now, <laughs> Talk about the before the S hit the fan. But I was in town because I got a job at Rhode Island College. So when the lawsuit was filed, Louise approached me and said, um, I'd appreciate it if it goes to trial, if you would testify on our, uh, my behalf. And I kind of weaseled and said, well, we'll see. And then George Hicks came to me and said, if it goes to trial, we expect to be on our side. So I was very, very thankful that it did not go to trial. Yeah. <laughs> stretching machine. But um, <clears throat> I was appalled by the decision not to give tenure to Louise in part because they've stressed the teaching so much. And when I went to Rhode Island College in 1972, uh, we had teacher evaluations, we had peer yeah. reviews, and it was kind of Mickey Mouse in my opinion, but when the lawsuit took place and I realized there had been no procedure whatsoever in place for evaluating Louise's teaching. It was all hearsay. And as we saw that, you know, George was soliciting letters and... Um, I was soliciting, know, letters. <laughs> soliciting letters. And there was absolutely no record whatsoever other than what people had in their minds. And of course, anybody who's taught knows that uh, whenever you do teaching evaluations, you get a of things, you know, some people like your teaching style, some don't, but in any case, there was absolutely nothing to go on, so they had a very, very weak case. Anyway, um, I'm glad we're having this whole uh, uh, conference, I'm glad we have the exhibition, I think that uh, it's a wonderful airing of all these uh, historical events, and uh, I look forward to the next uh, events. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Hi, I'm Peggy Muir, and I was Louise's student. <laughs> <laughs> I was sent out to plug the holes in the anthropology.
following data. I literally went out to the Canadian Maritimes to a fishing community because the monographs had all been about the men getting their boats and how you divided up the fishing areas. And then there would be this little paragraph in the monographs that said, and the women do all the child care, putting up crafts, housework, etc. So part of what we, Louise did was to set us out to deal with the et cetera, to deal with women's work. And what hasn't come up in this conference so far, Louise, is how not only you change the discipline of anthropology, but more so how feminism has changed economics, political science, and I would say biology and yeah. physics too, <laughs> that this case is not just because of the criticisms leveled at Louise about the work she did on women, that it isn't just about getting women on the faculty or getting a class in the anthropology of women. It's much more about how academia as a whole has integrated feminism into the way we study the world and understand the world. So Louise, I wonder if you could just comment yeah. on what you've seen about that. Yeah, because. I've thought a lot about this and written about it too. Um, and it's not just feminism and anthropology changed a lot, but feminists were in there trying to make these changes. And the difference is between you know, when I first did my fieldwork on the novel, like everybody else in the field, you kind of wrote these objectivist uh, ethnographies. And I'm not using objectivists in a, in a pejorative way. What I'm saying is that we, we wrote in this distant kind of way, like we were sitting on a beam there looking down at everybody and what they were doing. We were not in the text. And anthropology has really changed about how we, people do ethnographies now. Uh, the uh, author, the anthropologist is in the text. They say, I did this, and I asked this kind of question, and this is what people responded, or this is how people thought something when I first got there. Uh, but the other thing has to do with, um, with the voices of people who you're studying. It used to be you would describe what people were doing, but nobody, nobody's voice came out. And now people are writing wonderful ethnographies with people's voices in it. Uh, I was just on a, a chair of a, a book prize committee for the Society for the Anthropology of North America. And we had 30 books, and there were about 10 of them that were really terrific. And mostly, they were ones in which you got the voices of the people that uh, people were studying. And somebody like Lynn Stephen, for example, uh, you know, has kind of given authorship to the folks she works with in Oaxaca. Now, these are folks who speak an indigenous language. Uh, but she's used the notion of testimonial in her book, uh, to, and also as a website uh, where the testimonials are all there, and they're authored by the people who are speaking. And so I think that's the next thing we have to do is do more of this co-authorship with people that, that, that we work with, uh, rather than treating them as subjects that we go out and study, uh, but as co-workers on uh, projects that uh, they want to have done as well. So I, I, and I think feminist anthropology has had a big role in, in creating that kind of possibility in, in anthropology. But you're quite right, Peggy. Great comment. Great. Yes. Barbara? Yeah, get Barbara. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this is not really a question, it's just an observation. So I was, I'm Barbara Rabb, class of 81, and I was one of the people who helped uh, with this project. And one of the things that um, I was reminded of, I think I knew this at the time, I also with Amy was a, a reporter at the Herald, and Amy was actually my editor and handed the lamp for beat over to me uh, for a short time. But one of the things that I was reminded of as we put this all together, and I just feel like it's part of the texture of what makes all of this so interesting is that I believe um, at the time that Judge Patin was the judge on this case and Milton Stanzler was the lead attorney on this case, they were both members of the uh, university club, which did not allow women yeah. to uh, not only join, but I'm not even sure women, could women? Couldn't have, I mean, Anne Faust was the one that's actually 
<laughs> so, I mean, I guess. Oh, for 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 people who didn't hear that, you could you could, if you were a woman, you had to be invited, and then you had to go in through a separate door, which is. <laughs> but anyway, I and and. Point about the university club is that university business was conducted. Yes. <laughs> was an and uh, people went there for lunch when the candidate came, so that's why you didn't go to lunch when. But uh, you know, I just I wanted to raise that both just because of the sort of rich irony of it, but also I would also say that your case and of course what was going on in the world, but that was all part of it not only changed this university and I think other universities, but also our little town of Providence, Rhode Island, where yeah. there were things going on, even you know, it, among right. people who were entirely sympathetic to your case that were antithetical to the spirit of it. So I just thought it was yeah. worth pointing out. Mm -hmm. right. Yes? I mean, wait, wait a minute, let's hand the um, mic back. It's Hi, Susan Jerby. I'm uh, the founding chair and served for 10 years as chair of the Department of Molecular Biology, Cell Biology, and Biochemistry. Uh, so I have two questions, but before that, I just wanted to mention that when I was job interviewed at Brown in 1972, they took me to lunch at the University Club. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we had to go in through a special door and go into a special room where women were the, that was the only room where women were allowed. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, I was hired. <laughs> uh, so two questions. One, having served as, as chair of my department for 10 years, I wanted to applaud you for your efforts, which brought the consent decree to Brown, because that really has been terrific in terms of having transparency and, and yeah. putting in place procedural issues uh, and procedures, I should say. Um, so my first question is that has recently been vacated uh, because a sufficient amount of time has right. elapsed and, and they feel that Brown has done its thing. Do you see any negatives in terms of vacating the dissent decree? Mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah, I, I don't know. I think the panel is going to work on that in the next. In the, okay. I mean, I wasn't here for that, but I know that. Um, and it's in the timeline now. Is that um, the ten years later, the university moved to vacate degree, and the women faculty said, "Uh, uh we're not far enough." And so it wasn't until 1993. Is that right? The when it was vacated. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can save that for the next. Next session. Yep. So That'd be a great. Question. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second question I have is I was a junior faculty member coming up from tenure just at the time all this was oh, happening. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so, as you alluded to, Brown was in deep financial trouble, oh. and uh, the corporation caught on to the fact that President Hornig was dipping into the endowment uh, in order to pay the heating bills, which is a no-no. Yeah, no. And they slapped his hand and said, no, you can't do this because we're going to be totally broke. And as a result of that uh, and the economic crisis the university was facing, a white paper was sent out to all faculty, especially to untenured faculty, to say that when our contracts were going to come due, none of us would probably be renewed because the university had a contract, at which point I started looking for another job and then yeah. as it turned out I had two job offers and then uh, my tenure case was positive at Brown and so I stayed. Um, but because of the financial difficulty that fa Brown faced at the time uh, and the mounting legal fees, uh, they sent out a request to other universities to come and help them. Uh, and that, there was no university that came to uh, assist Brown financially in, in terms of this. So I wonder if you could comment on the national impact that your case may have had, especially because of the fact that universities seem to be uh, not wanting to get involved with this type of thing. Hmm. Uh, well, I think a lot of universities were and had cases against them. Because mm -hmm. Um, my sense is that Title VII started to apply to universities around 1972, and my case was filed in uh, uh, 75. And uh, when Susan Reeves wrote this thing in the like monthly about the case, which was somewhere probably in early 77, uh, she listed a whole bunch of cases. Uh, and, and so I, 
not all of them turned out uh, in, the, in the women's favor, but I think the, the fear in Brown, which I think was probably pretty widespread, was that courts would intervene in these personnel decisions. Uh, and that universities were different kinds of institutions. But I, but I think oh, at the same time, people started cutting their back ends by starting putting procedures, by starting to you know, pay more attention to the affirmative action officer, mm -hmm. by getting their affirmative action mm -hmm. uh, plan approved. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of this was kind of a ripple effect. You didn't have to have a suit in the university to realize, well, we've got to have teaching evaluations. Or, you know, we really need to have some kind of uh, staffing plan, and we really need to have goals and timetables went out the window pretty quickly because people began to call them quotas, mm -hmm. which they were not. Uh, but I, I, think, I think universities started to change because uh, there wasn't just my case, but people could see that there were, there were ways in which women could charge discrimination and that there were things that people needed to mm -hmm. do to kind of show up their act. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Um, yep, there we go. Who was it? it was Who had, was it Capella? Was it you? Did you have your hand up? Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Capella Khan. Um, I just retired in June from the English department. And um, yeah. I wanted to make a comment, this is not a question, uh, about the great benefits for everyone, male faculty members yeah, right. as well as female faculty members and the institution as a whole from your case. Yeah. When, I believe this is true, when, when Brown started uh, pursuing the tenuring process under the consent decree, a lot of rules of transparency and fairness were instituted. Right. Yeah. And I'd just like to touch on two of them. One, uh, letters from outside evaluators were required, and the process of choosing the outside right. evaluators <clears throat> was uh, vetted and overseen so that the deck couldn't be stacked. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you get to yeah. put in some names yourself. Yes, the in candidate names. puts in names, the department puts in names, and um, uh, the um, chair looks over this and so on. Uh, and frankly, I'm forgetting the second rule, but that gives you an <laughs> yeah. idea. And um, I was here at Brown when um, the first motion to vacate the consent decree was put forth to the faculty, and like many people, I was worried. And there was, I remember the faculty meeting in which at least two male faculty members from the sciences stood up and said that under these rules, more women had been hired in the sciences, and that was of great benefit to them as researchers and as teachers. So um, this rule, this, Louise, the Louise Lamphere case and the consent decree had enormous impact. It made the tenuring process much fairer. Not that it's perfect, and injustices can still occur, but it had enormous impact. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Good. We were. We'll take a short break and reconvene at a little around 11 o'clock. <laughs>